Hi, this is the Module 1, Section 8, Part 2 video. In Part 1, we talked about the uh, force of interest and the definition of the force of interest. That's a, and as you can see in the title, in this uh, video, we're going to try to recover the accumulation function from the force of interest. Let me explain that a little bit more. This is the definition of the force of interest that we saw in the Part 1 video. And as we see here, if, I, if you're given the accumulation function, then it's very easy to get the force of interest from the accumulation function. You just follow the directions here. You take the derivative of the accumulation function, and then you divide it by the accumulation function. That ratio gives you the force of interest. So that's kind of easy in a way. Uh, as long as you can take that derivative, it's, it's easy in a way. What's a little bit harder is what if you were given the force of interest and you're trying to recover the accumulation function from that? So that's what we'll address in this video. The first thing to recognize when we're trying to do this is from the definition, you see we've got this ratio. In the numerator, we have a derivative of a function. In the denominator, we have the function. What we're going to do is recognize that as the derivative of the natural log of the function. So maybe it's easier to go in the reverse direction. If I gave you the problem, how would you take the derivative with respect to t of the natural log of a of t? You would say, oh, well, you take 1 over a of t and then times the derivative of a of t. That's exactly then that ratio a prime of t divided by a of t. And so I'm going to delete the middle expression here. We're going to recognize that the force of interest could have just as well been defined as the derivative with respect to t of the natural log of a of t. So again, what I'm trying to do is find, is, is basically I'm trying to solve this equation. This is a differential equation. I'm trying to solve this uh, equation for a of t. And so uh, you might see kind of the process that we need to go through to unwind things. Uh, I need to take an anti, first I need to take an antiderivative of both sides. Well, that's an integral. And so when I take the, uh, uh, the in, when I integrate both sides, uh, I'm going to reverse the sides actually. And so on the left hand side, I'm going to write the natural log of A of T. And on the right hand side, I integrate delta T. Uh, and this is a, this is a, a fact from uh, calculus. This is one of the fundamental theorems of calculus is that uh, on the, uh, when, you're, when, you're in, when you take an antiderivative or when you integrate in both sides, the right-hand side would be, uh, you could represent that as an integral from some number. So that lower limit of integration, I have a C there, it's some, it's some fixed, at this point fixed but unknown value, and I'm integrating from that C to T, and then I have to, uh, this is just, uh, you know, notation. I can't write delta sub t dt because t is one of the limits of integration, so I need to change that to a delta sub r dr. So on the, this, is, this is mathematically the proper way that I would integrate both sides from the first, getting, from the, first the top uh, equation when I uh, want to take antiderivatives or integrate both sides. This is kind of mathematically the proper thing that I should do based on, uh, again, one of those fundamental theorems of calculus. Okay, so now let's, let's talk about, well, what should that C value be? So I'm going to use uh, technically what's called an initial condition. Uh, I'm going to plug in a zero for T. And so in the second equation, that bottom equation there, where you see a T, I'm going to put a zero in both spots. And now I'm, uh, I'm going to do that because I know the initial condition. I know that A of zero equals a one. So I'll plug in a one for the A of zero. Now, the natural log of 1 is 0, so I'll, I'll plug in the, a 0 for that. And, and now, at this point, this, this tells me what the C value has to be. When I integrate from C to 0, when I integrate the, the, uh, the force of interest from C to 0, I need to get 0. And so that's, this is uh, kind of telling me that the C value uh, itself is going to have to be 0. And so, in other words, when I go back to the fundamental theorem of calculus, one of those uh, uh, fundamental theorem of calculus equations, uh, the C value there is now going to be a 0. Now, that's kind of the hard part. There was a little bit of technicality in there that I mostly hand waved through. Uh, but there's a, uh, that was kind of the hard part because at this point now, I just want to solve for A of T, and I would do that by exponentiating both sides. So this is how I would recover A of T if you were to give me the force of interest, the function that defines or an expression that defines the force of interest, then this is what I would do to recover the uh, accumulation function. 
Okay, so now let me put uh, both the definition of the accumulation function uh, up there together with uh, how I would recover the accumulation function from the force of interest. So on the left-hand side, I'm thinking if you give me the accumulation function, this is what I'm going to do to get the force of interest. The right side, the right-hand equation, if you give me the force of interest, this is what I'm going to do to get the, uh, 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 to get the accumulation function. Okay, the next thing I want to do is I want to talk about, well, remember, you know, one of the key things that we're doing in here is, is uh, accumulating and discounting uh, money from, from one time value to another time value. So let's look at, say, the periodic accumulation factor from time k to time n. And so this would be, uh, I know that it's the ratio of the A of N to the A of K values. And now uh, I've, I'm going to use the, uh, the, the exponential expression that I have over there for A of T. I'm going to plug in an N. And so N becomes the upper limit of integration in the numerator. And, and then K becomes the upper limit of integration in the denominator. And so I've got this, I've got this ratio of exponentials. Um, well, they've got the same base E, so I can write it as a single exponential using rules of, of exponents, right, as a single exponential, and I would subtract the, uh, the exponent in the numerator. Uh, I would take the exponent in the numerator and subtract from that the exponent in the denominator. And now let's look at the, uh, the, the exponent there. It's a difference of, of integrals. So think of these integrals as being the area under a curve, and the first integral would be an area under a curve from 0 to n, and then the next one would be the area under the curve from 0 to k that I'm subtracting off. So one of the properties of integrals is that if you integrate, if you take an integral from 0 to n and you subtract off uh, and this, the same integral, but this time from 0 to k, then what you're going to be left with is the area under the curve from k to n, or the integral from k to n of, uh, of the integram. And so let me kind of clean this up and, and show you that uh, the, the periodic accumulation factor then from k to n would be uh, e raised to the integral from k to n, you're going from time k to time n of uh, delta sub t dt. So if I give you the um, if I give you the, the, the force of interest, then uh, you should know how, use this fact to get what the periodic accumulation uh, factors are from k to n. And of course, I could uh, look at periodic discount factors instead of periodic accumulation factors. So the periodic discount factor from n to k go through the exact same process, and you'll see that it's e to the integral from uh, e raised to the power, and the, and the exponent is an integral from n to k of delta t dt. Again, I want to point out why I, I use this notation. Uh, if we look in the middle at the middle expression, the periodic accumulation factor, I'm going from time k to time n, and look at the X, look at the integral and the exponent. You're integrating from time k to time n. So you're always going from wherever you're, you're, you're moving the money from to wherever you're moving the money to. And the same can be true, the, the same can be said for the, the, the last equation there, the periodic discount factor. I'm going from time n to time k. So I integrate from time n to time k, and then that's going to be my exponent. Now, some folks, uh, some study materials and, 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 um, even some, I've seen this on uh, SOA website before, they'll rewrite this periodic discount factor, the last one that I have here, as an e raised to the minus integral from k to n of delta t dt. Uh, and of course, that's true. If you look at the two expressions next to one another, you can see the difference is, uh, is, is in interchanging the limits of integration. And that's one of the, 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 the properties of integrals, is if you integrate uh, from a to b, uh, it, you'll get the negative of the integral from b to a. And so uh, that's, what, uh, that's what rule is being used here. I don't particularly like that expression for the periodic discount factor. I would rather use this expression that I have because I, I don't have to worry about when do I put a minus sign in or, or, or do I put a minus sign in or not. You always integrate from wherever you're moving the money from to the time value of where you're moving the money to, and then that becomes your exponent always. Okay, so uh, this was how you then recover the accumulation function from a uh, force of interest and uh, how you calculate periodic accumulation and periodic discount factors once you're given the, uh, the force of interest. 
All right, I'll see you in the next video.